All right, welcome everyone and thank you all for attending our February webinar. So here at Phoenix LiDAR Systems, our focus is to provide our customers with industry leading for solutions that can be tailored to each customer's unique mapping application and needs. Our solutions are designed to be flexible, meaning you can acquire and process airborne, mobile, backpack, plus other types of data through a streamlined workflow. We have been pioneering the platform flexible LiDAR mapping space since 2013, beginning with the first commercial UAV LiDAR system hardware, accompanied by the first real-time 3D point cloud visualization software, the first UAV LiDAR terrain following flight planner, and the first fully automated cloud-based LiDAR post-processing platform, LiDAR Mill. So I'm Corey Kelm, the Senior Geomatics Engineer here at Phoenix. And today I have the pleasure of presenting the new mobile data processing features within Spatial Explorer 7. Many users have recently discovered the benefits of mobile acquisition, including data density, accuracy, efficiency of collection, and the ability to go where airborne vehicles often cannot, making this a highly valuable mapping option. In this webinar, we'll take a close look at our mobile LiDAR and imagery processing workflow and discuss mobile data properties, advantages, considerations, and how Phoenix's Spatial Explorer 7 software can be used to make the most of what you acquire. We'll begin by going over some of the general benefits to mobile LiDAR mapping. Then we'll take a deeper dive into the specific benefits offered by the new Spatial Explorer 7 mobile features. And finally, I'll guide you through a mobile processing workflow demonstration from start to finish, which includes mobile LiDAR calibration using LiDAR Snap 4 and mobile imagery processing using Camera Snap 2. At the end, we'll save some time for a question and answer session. So go ahead and type any questions you may have into the chat. And we'll do our best to address all of them. So let's start with some of the general benefits of mobile LiDAR. So what types of projects are best suited for mobile mapping? Well, if your project has high accuracy and high point density requirements, your two options are terrestrial scanning or mobile scanning. Mobile scanning is ideal for long transportation corridor projects as you can collect this high accuracy and high density data much faster and safer than using a terrestrial scanner. Some example applications for mobile mapping include roadway design, bridge surveys, as-built surveys, and asset inventory. Mobile data is a high accuracy mapping option as all targets within the scan are typically quite close to the sensor in comparison to aerial mapping. Taking beam divergence into consideration, the shorter the range to the scan target, the smaller the resulting laser footprint is on that target, resulting in a more accurate return. In terms of density, mobile data is much denser than aerial data. Aerial data sets are typically on the order of tens to hundreds of points per square meter, whereas mobile data sets are typically on typically on the order of hundreds to thousands of points per square meter. This allows you to map at a very high level of detail in dense urban areas to pick up curb and gutters, guardrails, poles, signage, vertical planes, etc. In terms of safety, there is no need for lane closures or stopping traffic, and this reduced impact on traffic leads to less field crews on the side of the road, which is inherently more safe. You can collect LiDAR data day or night, so you can plan light traffic times and not collect data when there is extremely heavy traffic. Um, this is safer for the operator and also um, allows you to collect better data. In terms of efficiency, you can collect high density and high accuracy data while traveling with the flow of traffic. And that's much faster than terrestrial scanning. Since the platform is a car, you can scan for hours until you run out of gas, and then you can simply fill up and continue scanning for more hours. You can collect obscure data that UAVs cannot on the underside of bridges, for example. Also, you are not restricted by airspace or nighttime flying restrictions com compared to aerial scanning. Compared to multiple static scanner setups or paying for a helicopter, mobile scanning is a cost-effective solution that can lower overall project costs. There are also numerous value-added reports produced from mobile LiDAR point cloud data or the extracted line work, including cross-section reports, cross-slope reports, guardrail reports, et cetera. So 
So now let's take a deeper dive into the Spatial Explorer 7 mobile processing benefits. So the, the biggest benefit offered by Spatial Explorer 7 is the ability to do everything all in one software. It's a one-stop shop. So you can collect and process mobile data in the same software. Two highly valuable uh, new features that Spatial Explorer 7 offers is robust, robust automated camera calibration and robust automated LiDAR calibration. And with that camera calibration, you have the ability to quickly and easily customize uh, masks and create masks within um, the panoramic images to block out areas um, that you do not want to include with it, within your RGB extraction. When it comes to automated LiDAR calibration, it truly produces industry-leading results uh, with minimal effort. So unlike other software that requires a lot of manual effort and creating tie lines, uh, there's no need for that. It's all automated and the calibration just simply works. This software is designed for vehicle flexibility, meaning that one day you can be collecting uh, data on a vehicle, collecting mobile data, and the other day you can be you know, flying a UAV um, or on the same day. And then you can bring that data into the Spatial Explorer and combine that mobile and aerial data and automatically automatically calibrate one data set to another, which is extremely valuable. So taking a look at the workflow here, um, Spatial Explorer 7 is uh, an expandable software that provides a complete workflow from data acquisition to final product creation. So starting with the top, you can uh, perform mission guidance um, with Spatial Explorer 7, and you can know which lines you've already driven, which lines you still need to drive. Um, and you can collect navigation data, LIDAR data, and imagery data within the software. Then you can, once you're finished in the field, come back to the office. You can do your trajectory processing in the same software, <clears throat> do your LIDAR, uh, LIDAR and camera calibration, and the colorization of the point cloud. You can produce all kinds of quality control reports in an automated fashion. And finally, you can create paid product deliverables um, like classified and colorized point clouds or um, products like digital elevation models, digital surface models, and contours. So if we're looking at the uh, mobile acquisition aspect of Spatial Explorer 7, um, we can first take a look at mission guidance. So mission guidance within Spatial Explorer 7 ensures a complete data collection. So the pilot and the sensor operator can be on the same page as far as which lines you've already driven and which lines you still need to drive. And there, there are some handy line management tools within mission guidance to know, um, to automatically detect uh, which line to go to next, or you can also do um, a more manual method and have more control over that. Um, you can also view, um, configure, and control your sensors in real time and get that real-time feedback in the, the data visualization as well. Once you are done in the field, um, come back to the office and you can do your trajectory processing right here within Spatial Explorer 7. And it gives you two options to post-process your navigation data into a smooth and filtered trajectory. You can either use the cloud-based NavLab option from within Spatial Explorer or our new NavLab Embedded, where you can have a, a local license if you do not have internet access. One of the best new features in Spatial Explorer 7 is LiDAR Snap. LiDAR Snap 4 is used to fine tune the accuracy of your LiDAR data and it truly produces industry leading results. After years of LiDAR processing, I have not encountered another software that produces better mobile LiDAR calibration results as LiDARSnap 4. LiDARSnap uses observations from overlapping LiDAR passes to correct imperfections remaining in the estimated trajectory. So on the left side, you see a non-optimized data set, and on the right side, that shows a LiDARSnap optimized data set. You can see the difference. Um, the best part about it all is that it's extremely easy to use. 
you simply select the vehicle type to optimize the calibration. And as the software automatically detects the LiDAR scanner model, it will default to pre-selected optimized parameters based on the specified vehicle and scanner. It also gives you the ability to use a control point cloud. So in this example, we have a calibrated, we want to calibrate a mobile data set to an existing airborne mission. And you can bring both those data sets into Spatial Explorer. And essentially with the click of a button, you can um, fuse these two data sets into one cohesive point cloud. Another value added feature is Camera Snap 2. And so within Spatial Explorer 7, we can now calibrate the 360 degree um, mobile imagery from the ladybug. And we can do this either auto automatically, which is once again, extremely quick and easy and produces um, amazing results. And, or you can use a more um, hands-on manual method if preferred. Um, some improvements that have been implemented are the, um, is the per photo pose correction which really dials this uh, camera calibration accuracy down to millimeters. Uh, quality improvements through better outlier rejection have been implemented as well as speed improvements. So this calibration now takes only seconds instead of minutes. Um, we, I mentioned the custom mask editor and uh, within camera snap two, uh, you can use a custom mask editor for removing obstructions such as vehicle roofs, the GNSS antenna, uh, maybe your LiDAR scanners in the imagery. And so we don't want to include this within the RGB extraction. So we can create custom masks to exclude that. And along the lines of uh, RGB extraction, we can now do smarter RGB extraction by utilizing uh, both surface normals and occlusion detection. And finally, there are um, a number of quality control reports that are automatically in generated and this quickly ensures that your data meets spec. And so at the end of every, um, once you get done classifying, uh, calibrating, classifying, colorizing your point cloud, um, the end user and, and making deliverable data products, the end user wants to know things like what kind of relative and absolute accuracy um, is this data. So you can uh, utilize these automatic generated reports to view, to uh, review all kinds of um, all kinds of things like your coordinate reference system, what time um, the, the data was collected and processed, accuracy, all kinds of plots. Um, so you can really get a, um, a deep, deep dive into the data set and see how well it was processed. And there are both reports for data processors and end users. Um, so yeah, once again, this it saves you a lot of time and money. I remember before we had this automatic uh, report generation, we would spend hours per data set trying to, uh, trying to create these project reports. So uh, this is quite nice to have all of this information automatically generated for you and uh, in a concise and, and clear format. So I'm sure many of you are visual learners and we all know that the proof is in the pudding as they say. So I've prepared a video that walks you through the mobile data processing uh, from start to finish within Spatial Explorer 7. So let me go ahead and get that queued up. And after this uh, video has finished, we will resume and uh, we will get move along to the question and answer portion. This video demonstrates how quick and easy it is to perform mobile LiDAR Kello calibration and imagery processing within Spatial Explorer version 7. We will start by clipping trajectories to define the intervals where we want to generate a point cloud. We will then calibrate the point cloud, create camera mass, and calibrate the camera, and finally colorize and classify the point cloud. Let's get started. Our first step is to define the intervals or sections of the trajectory where we would like to generate a point cloud. Do this by manually specifying start and end times by marking the positions on the trajectory and creating intervals from those positions.
The next step is to generate a point cloud using those positions. Configure minimum and maximum LiDAR range from sensor, field of view, and any other parameters you wish to apply to the point cloud. Click on the Create Point Cloud tool to specify a point cloud file name and to specify which intervals should be used to create the point cloud. Later in the video, we will calibrate the camera, so it is best to find a hashtag area of your dataset where the vehicle makes perpendicular oncoming passes. Manually create intervals that extend around 80 meters out from the intersection point. After a point cloud is created, you can colorize the point cloud by GPS time and take cross section throughout the dataset in order to visualize vertical offsets and relative swath to swath misalignments and inaccuracies. To resolve these misalignments, we will calibrate the point cloud using LiDAR Snap 4. LiDAR Snap 4 is an automated tool that performs feature matching within overlapping swaths of LiDAR data to determine correction offsets that are applied to the mission's trajectory to improve point cloud relative accuracy. Here you can select which intervals to use for calibration and which position and orientation parameters to optimize. Once LiDAR Snap has finished, a detailed cloud calibration report is automatically generated. This report shows many quality control plots and metrics for you to review. After optimization, we can see that the misalignment has been corrected and our overlapping LiDAR swaths are snapped together extremely well. To further demonstrate this, I'll first fuse the point cloud using the raw, unprocessed trajectory. As you can see, the misalignments are significant. Now let's fuse the cloud using the PPK trajectory. We can see there is a significant increase in relative accuracy, however there are still some misalignments. Finally, let's fuse the cloud using the LiDAR Snap optimized trajectory. Even comparing a PPK trajectory to a LiDAR Snap trajectory, we can see a massive improvement in relative accuracy. Testing of LiDAR Snap capabilities compared to other industry standard LiDAR calibration workflows has shown time and time again that the new LiDAR Snap version 4 is the industry leader in LiDAR calibration tools. The next step is to create camera masks before we calibrate the Ladybug camera. Spatial Explorer makes it easy to create and edit camera receptor masks to exclude areas of the imagery that include the vehicle, sensors, or other undesirable features that should not be included during camera calibration or LiDAR colorization. You have the option of creating brand new masks, editing existing masks, or importing masks from a previous project.
After receptor masks have been created, it is time to automatically calibrate the Ladybug camera using CameraSnap 2. Select the camera calibration intervals previously created and click OK to begin camera calibration. Once camera snap is finished, a detailed report is automatically generated showing many quality control plots and metrics for you to review. Now that the point cloud has been optimized and the camera is calibrated, it is time to colorize the point cloud. CameraSnap 2 utilizes the custom mass, surface normals, and occlusion detection for smarter RGB extraction. The final step is to classify the point cloud. For best results, start by running a noise filter to remove any noisy or inaccurate points from the point cloud, which could potentially negatively affect the ground filter. After the noise has been classified, the next step is to classify ground. Choose a ground filter, configure the user specified customizable parameters, configure the input and output classes, and then run the automated classification routine. Finally, use the Classify on Selection tool to manually classify point cloud features. In this example, a moving vehicle was scanned and we would like it removed from the dataset. The process to remove a vehicle is to first create a profile isolating this feature. Then open up the Classify on Selection window and configure the old and new classes and enable Classify on Selection. Then simply choose one of the selection tools in this case, the classify above line tool, click the starting point and then click the end point. In this example, any class above the line will be classified as a noise class. While exporting this point cloud to an LAS or LAZ file, Spatial Explorer gives you the option to exclude any undesirable point classes from the export.
It has been my pleasure walking you through the SE7 mobile processing workflow. This is Corey, signing off. All right, thank you all for your time and attention um, watching that video and uh, for attending this webinar. And we would like to open it up to um, the question and answer portion. So I'll hand it back to um, Ben Adler. Are you on, are you available? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Corey. Hi, Ben. How's it going? Hey. Uh, good, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so, in terms of Q&A, I think there were a couple, I see a chat here with a couple of questions. Um, is that a public chat or I think so. Um, so there was a question about whether uh, the backpack can be used for mapping caves. Um, and I believe Conrad, you answered that um, and said that that can be done using SLAM, but that isn't really part of this, this webinar um, since that's like more, I would say a pedestrian acquisition, not a mobile acquisition. Um, but the ideas kind of transfer from from mobile to backpack pretty well. So obviously, yeah, you'd have it on a backpack and maybe you wouldn't have a ladybug um, and you definitely wouldn't have a wheel sensor. Uh, but in the end, uh, you get a point cloud and then um, some of that, uh, like classifying ground in a cave would be very hard because um, that's not what the ground filter is designed to do. But I think it would, uh, like, yeah, you can just, move the ideas that you just saw um, from mobile to, to backpack mapping. Um, and then another question was, uh, is the software cloud-based or can we process data locally? So um, I think Corey kind of kind of showed it in the video. So Spatial Explorer is a desktop software. Um, we do offer LIDAR Miller as well, which is the cloud version of, uh, of this software. Um, and of course, the just by, by nature, these softwares differ in in some uh, advantages and disadvantages, like you can share data in the cloud, uh, but you need to be online for the cloud. So that's why we offer those two options for uh, our customers. Um, so far, I believe, let me see. Oh, there's more. Um, oh, there's a question. Um, what are the limitations for registering aerial data to ground data in SE7? Um, that's a great question. Um, we have done this before and it works. So you can combine aerial and ground data as well as GCPs in SE7. Right now there is a limitation in that um, if you want to work with raw data um, in where you fuse the, the LiDAR and trajectory to a point cloud, the IMU orientations have to match. So if you angle the IMU differently on a car than you do on the UAV, then you first have to process one cloud um, fuse it, calibrate it if you like, and then re-import it and then fuse with the with the next raw data. That's something we're looking to to optimize for SE8. Um, but that's, uh, I think, the only known uh, disadvantage right now with combining data sets in SE7. Um, for mobile data sets, how do you handle GCP alignment? Um, well, you import them. <laughs> um, so the video hasn't shown it, but uh, you can just go to file, open and import your CSV, define the mapping from uh, the axes, well, the, the coordinate system, as well as which column in the CSV is what. Um, so you import them, um, they're shown in Spatial Explorer, and then uh, you just run LiDAR snap and include those GCPs and it will optimize the cloud um, to them. Um, and then usually the question is, well, how does it do that? So we have a tool for uh, static shifting of the point cloud, um, which actually shifts the trajectory, not the cloud. Um, and the cloud is then moved because the trajectory moves. Um, or the more integrated approach in LiDAR Snap 4, which actually um, includes this in trajectory optimization. So it's more flexible, but some people uh, don't like that. They just want to introduce a static shift. So you can do both. Um, Sorry, I need to read this question. Is most still just vertical adjustment? No, it's not. Um, or can you rubber sheet the trajectory point cloud to the GCPs? Yes, you can. 
Um, and there's different uh, trajectory optimization modes. So for aerial, you can still decide to just shift complete flight lines, um, or you can actually do um, a more uh, spline-based approach where you really are free to move the, the trajectory. Um, and then you can select which parts to optimize. So oftentimes you only want to optimize up, for example, or you can uh, let the optimizer freely uh, change any of position and orientation in the trajectory. Um, will the processing be the same for aerial scanning is, is one question. Um, yes, it is the same. Uh, sometimes, for example, uh, yes, the GNSS reception is often better in, uh, in aerial mapping. So you may need less trajectory optimization, but all the concepts are really the same. And of course, you can also load GCPs um, into aerial data sets. Um, sorry, <laughs> the questions are... Oh, somebody's moving them to answered. Well, thank you. That must be you, Lido. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, can you use data collected from a terrestrial scanner um, in Space Explorer to re register the scans? Yes, you can. Um, we added a way to import uh, last files that's been there for quite a while. So you can convert that to our native uh, cloud format. Um, and then you can use it in LIDAR Snap as a control cloud. Um, so we do sometimes use that to uh, calibrate multi-LIDAR systems um, and also work in our calibration algorithm. So yeah, if you completely trust one point cloud, um, maybe you just trust uh, its relative accuracy or hopefully you can also trust its absolute accuracy, then you can calibrate your um, raw data to that and work out uh, the sensor calibration. Um, okay. Um, can you export the calibrated camera stream file to a format that drops into Tobodot? Yes, you can. Um, I think starting with SE, I forgot to be honest with which version, uh, but yes, you can. Um, you would go to tools, camera, edit camera events, and the bottom right, you click on export, and then you export it to Tobodot. Um, and that question reminds me that new in SE7, um, this may actually be 7.1 or something that's coming up pretty soon, um, where it's a little more optimized. Um, you can color the point cloud by normal, um, which is extremely helpful in seeing, for example, how how the curvature of curbs or, or any surface really changes. And it helps a lot with extraction. I say that because I assume the question um, for Topodot is motivated by the idea to see the point cloud next to the photo uh, for uh, line work extraction or uh, work like that. And we found that colorizing a point cloud by normal really helps with that. And then you have the, the helpful color as well as the, um, the point cloud really under, under the mouse cursor at the same time. So it usually helps a lot with, with extraction efficiency. I hope that made sense. <laughs> um, is there an option to split trajectory by RxP record? We turn scanner on and off in the field. Whoops, somebody moved the question. Um, rather than manually splitting in SE. Uh, um, there is an option when you cut trajectories to require LIDAR coverage. And if so if a part of a trajectory is not covered by LIDAR, um, it can't become an, an interval or a flight line uh, to be processed. So I think this should work. Um, if not, please um, describe exactly what you would like to work and send it to support at phoenixlider.com. Thank you. Is there an easy way now in Spatial Explorer to convert from meters to feet? Um, not quite sure about that question. So we don't have like a, I don't know, tools uh, unit converter dialog, but what I assume um, this question means is, is there a way to use different units when it comes to importing and exporting uh, data? So for example, yes, you can, uh, when you import GCPs, for example, you can specify a coordinate system and with that you can specify units. Um, so there's uh, international feed and US feed and meters uh, is all in there. Um, so yes, and the same goes when you export, for example, a point cloud. Um, I'm sure there's some, yeah, I'm sure you can find some export where it doesn't work, but for the main imports and exports, I think uh, 
they all support this. Um, yeah, and if you need something, some export to support this, um, then let us know, please. Of course, there's many exports where it really doesn't make sense. For example, if you export to uh, KML, then uh, the units and even the coordinate system is, is set. Um, but there is, if there is a use case that we, we didn't see before, please let us know. Um, another question, Corey mentioned collected data until you run out of gas. Are there any data size limits, particularly with the imagery? Um, I haven't met a data set that didn't work. Um, I'm sure you can break it somehow, but uh, I've seen 17,000 images um, and those weren't an issue. And I think there is no, there's really no reason. I don't think there's an algorithm that doesn't scale. So, so long as you have enough temporary storage, I think you should be fine. Um, yes, for colorization as well as, uh, sorry, for calibration as well as colorization, um, this should work. Um, yeah, it's a tough question. So <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, it will do multi-hour uh, data sets because I've seen those work. Um, now, if you trigger for for uh, days and days and days, every couple of meters or seconds, um, maybe you'll hit a limit, but I'm not aware of one. Um, another question, did the adding a geoid process change instead of creating custom projections? So um, there's lots of uh, CRS work in SE7. Um, so for example, if you specify for in GCP import or cloud export, you specify a coordinate system that uses um, a geoid, so any orthometric height, um, Spatial Explorer 7 will check if that geoid is installed. And if not, it's gonna alert you to it and sh will show you a dialog with um, all the geodes that are available on our server in the cloud. So if you go to grids.phoenixladder.com, um, you can see those and then you can download them and then you can use them. Um, so previously in older versions, I think even in maybe up to five, it was more of a hack where you had to uh, define a, well, you, the, the project definition by hand um, and that worked, but it wasn't fun. Um, and now you can just use that dialog to specify a geoid or you can install your own geoids um, and use them, like manually pick them or import them and then in, into this dialog and then use them. Um, also in SE7 is the local coordinate system uh, tool where you can um, uh, import um, local and global coordinates and derive a transform uh, to, to match that and then you can use it just like any other coordinate system for importing GCPs or exporting uh, a point cloud. Um, another question, if you set the ladybug to trigger by distance, what is the recommended setting to get proper overlap at say 45 miles an hour? <laughs> okay, now you're putting me on the spot here. Um, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a number to answer. Um, it really depends, like I've heard of, customers say that their customers or their clients uh, demand a photo every seven meters, but I think it really depends on the job because technically with all those forward and backward facing cameras, um, it's really, it becomes a matter of taste how often you want to trigger. Um, some of the newer work we have there is that we can, like sometimes in, in mobile acquisition, when GNSS gets really bad, it becomes hard to, to trigger reliably when the navigation system is uh, is having trouble tracking satellites for, for longer times. So uh, we can now trigger the camera based on distance given by the wheel sensor. So even bad real-time navigation wouldn't, wouldn't uh, harm your image acquisition. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't, I can't give you a great answer right now for how often you want to trigger it. Um, yeah. Um, and I think those are all the questions that I see here. Um, if I missed any detail, uh, please uh, let us know, send, in, send, send an email to support or info. Um, and I hope we can help you out there. Um, yeah, if that's it, thank you guys for your attention and thank you, Corey, for the great uh, presentation and the video um, that looked pretty good.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben Adler. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time um, for, for next, next month's webinar. Have a great day, everyone.